ago, they were the only inhabitants and rightful owners of lands, marvelous valleys, monumental landscapes. They lived peaceably, their only concerns being to lead a calm life, in addition, of course, to hunting, planting, and reaping in the proper seasons. To receive knowledge from their elders and pass it on to their children, legends, mysticism, beliefs, mysteries. One day, all that began to change. The Europeans discovered the new world. At first, they seemed friendly, but as time passed, their greed for gold and riches led to wars and destruction. What ensued was generalized genocide. Entire peoples disappeared, destroyed by war or contaminated by diseases such as measles and chickenpox, which were unknown to them before then. Converted to Catholicism, forced to work as rubber tappers and gold miners, the indigenous went from being owners to slaves, obliged to work in exchange for food or to save their souls. Without adequate nourishment, with no care for their hygiene or health, the indigenous lived under precarious conditions. The Americas became independent. Nations were created, societies developed, always leaving the indigenous communities on a lower level. That's why today, less than a decade from the 21st century, the situation of the indigenous peoples of the Americas has changed very little. These populations live in an extreme state of poverty. Today, indigenous make up 6% of the population of the Americas. In some countries, such as Bolivia, the percentage is as high as 70%. The mortality rate due to lack of primary health care is higher in these communities. There are many diseases, diarrhea, cholera, pneumonia, measles, and tuberculosis, to name a few. All of this is directly related to living conditions, low income, lack of work and education, difficult access to basic services such as potable water, sewage disposal, electricity, health care, housing, and even food. The greatest problem is the lack of access to land because land is a fundamental part of indigenous culture. Land is central to life, culture, and history, and determines to a large extent the survival of indigenous peoples and nations, as well as their standards of living, health, and nutrition. In Winnipeg, Canada, in April of 1993, a conference was held to examine topics concerning the health and well-being of the indigenous communities of the Americas. After that, a plan of action was drawn up to improve the situation of the indigenous population. The need for a holistic approach to health, the right to self-determination of indigenous peoples, the right to systematic participation, respect for and revitalization of indigenous cultures, and reciprocity in relations. The decade of indigenous health in the world, 1994 to 2004, was also declared, which meant that whatever was related to improving the health of the indigenous would have priority. In Mexico, the indigenous population has suffered material poverty, social abandonment, inequality in the justice system, and marginalization in the political sector. In regard to health care, both the services and the quality of care are insufficient. Migration to the cities began long ago. With the lack of access to land for crop raising, the only option for many is to live in the cities. The indigenous communities invade abandoned buildings or land where they live under subhuman conditions without the basic resources of proper housing or health. We came out of necessity. We came because there is no work. The meeting is only three times a year. So we have nothing to eat. We have to live here in Mexico City and 
work in the street. Today, diseases most prevalent among indigenous groups are infectious in origin. Acute respiratory infections and intestinal infections. The most affected are the children and the elderly. Sometimes eight people live in a room only six feet square. <laughs> because of the problem of high rates of stillborn births and infant mortality and massive migration, the indigenous population is made up mainly of young people. With the lack of jobs, low salaries, and little hope of a better future, many become delinquents. One of the ways to avoid this would be to facilitate the access to schools from the time they are small and with an education related to their culture. We must send them to school to learn what we did not learn. We can't read or write. And we don't want our children to be like us. We want them to be taught more than we were. We didn't learn. These communities live from handiwork they produce and sell in the streets. The ones who work hardest are generally the women, who produce a product and then go out to sell it. Most of the men cannot find jobs because they have no special skill. However, some successful attempts have been made to help these communities. In Mexico City, there is a private institution called House of the Thousand Colors, which is doing innovative work with the indigenous from around the country. House of the Thousand Colors is a type of shelter and first aid center. Before going to a hospital or a specialized clinic, the family first takes the sick person to the house. The patient is examined and sent to a hospital or specialist. But that's not all the house does. It also provides lodging for the family members while the patient is in the hospital. These family members receive food and information about how to conduct themselves in Mexico City. After the patient leaves the hospital, they may stay a few days longer at the house until they are strong enough for the trip back to their hometown. Even with all of the effort and dedication of House of the Thousand Colors, the director, Major Ethicus, warns of the greatest problems that indigenous communities face in their country. First problem all of the communities in our country face is the great inequality in which they live. Unfortunately, in our country, being an indigenous is synonymous with being poor. And the idea occurred to us to provide a space where the indigenous women, children, and parents could stay and receive first-level attention with joint participation by public and private institutions. I believe the house is a good example of how things of quality, expensive things, and ones that the indigenous deserve can be achieved. In the Mexican town of Quintepec, the health center provides services for a community that is 100% indigenous. The health promoters meet regularly with the women of the town to discuss important matters such as clean drinking water, sewerage, schools, and especially ways to prevent disease. Only with the active participation of a community is it possible to make real progress and changes in the process of disease prevention. For the indigenous communities, traditional medicine is the main recourse in curing their diseases. Traditional medicine is a system of knowledge, beliefs, and practices designed to prevent and cure illness. It is practiced by therapists, socially referred to as curanderos, or shamans. Mr. Ricardo Alberto Castañedas, from the town of Masehuaca, Mexico, has practiced traditional medicine for over 20 years. He says that he learned from his ancestors. He trusts so completely in traditional medicine that he guarantees that almost all of the treatments are effective. Here we always try to cure. First we prescribe some herbs. We measure them out very carefully because they can cure a diarrhea. If this doesn't work, the next step is to combine the prescribed herb with some other treatment. It all goes together. 
A form of collaboration between traditional and Western medical systems must be created in a proposal for the alternate model of health that is readily accessible to the entire indigenous population. In Ecuador, as in the other countries, there is a large migration from the rural areas to the capital cities. The reasons for this are varied, but in most cases it is because of lack of jobs. In Quito, the capital of Ecuador, most of the indigenous live under subhuman conditions. They survive by selling handicrafts, products made in Asia, and fruits and vegetables in the markets and the streets. Their food generally comes from cheap restaurants run by themselves, in which there is no type of sanitary control whatsoever. Mr. Vincente Coreshumbe, a migrant from the province of Chimborazo and the owner of one of these restaurants, says that the problems are not only related to health. The problem is here in Quito, eight blocks from federal government headquarters, where we face problems of health, water, income. In the central part of Ecuador, in the town of Sabaras, the community also suffers as a result of migration. The town looks deserted, and the only ones who still live there are women and children. These children receive special care. They stay all day in a daycare center, where they receive food, have classes, and amuse themselves singing and playing. In spite of all efforts, health problems continue to be a threat to the children. What most affects the children under five is diarrhea. Maybe it is because of a lack of education of the people from the country. Cebaras is one of the poorest regions of Ecuador, and it has a mortality rate that is one of the highest due to disease and malnutrition. Efforts to minimize these factors are made by training local health promoters. Health promoters all through the Americas depend for support on the educational material they use in their talks. The best solution for basic problems of health is prevention, and prevention is best achieved through education. Traditional medicine offers various alternatives that must be recognized and promoted as an integral part of the proposals for the prevention of common diseases. Examples like this can be found in various countries in the Americas. In 1991, Peru experienced its worst cholera epidemic in its history. The indigenous communities were some of the most affected. By launching a massive campaign to educate the population, this epidemic was brought under control in time to prevent other cases. In Cajamarca, a town in the interior of Peru, health promoters brought together thousands of indigenous women so that they could learn how to avoid contamination by cholera. In the town of Ramadas in Bolivia, a local nurse teaches in her native language the care that must be taken in treating the water to prevent illness. In Tupisa, Bolivia, health workers take all precautions to combat Chagas disease. To do this, they teach the communities how to treat the walls of their houses and to fumigate every six months. They also distribute pamphlets and educational material. To identify a problem, to know it in an objective way, is a little difficult for the country people. But when we go there and take our audiovisual material, a rotafolio, a video cassette, and show them the stages of Chagas disease and how they can improve living conditions since it's a community project, they get motivated and respond better. The radio is used in Cochabamba, Bolivia, to broadcast information about disease prevention. These programs are transmitted in Quechua. In Atitan, Guatemala, the indigenous are taught in their native language. 
The health leaders are trained members of the community. In another town, in San Cristobal, Guatemala, the indigenous women get together to talk about their own problems in disease prevention. Today, they are beginning to have a new form of relationship with the men in their communities. They say we belong at home, but that's not right. We must have our place in society. We must fight for that place which belongs to us. Another type of very needy community is found along the rivers of the Amazon. The area is populated by mixed races of indigenous, Negroes, and whites. These communities also suffer from primary diseases that cause a large number of deaths. To teach these riverside communities about disease and forms of treatment, a local doctor is promoting a pioneer project in the region, the Health and Happiness Project. This project shows to the Amazonian river dwellers the basic principles of sanitation through play acting and circus presentations. Dr. Eugenio Scanavino Neto, director of the project, attends meetings and passes knowledge to the population and health promoters about the fundamentals of disease prevention using educational skits and circus numbers. The circus, the theater, art is the best teaching tool. First, because everyone participates, everyone creates something together. Second, it makes the learning process easy. And third, it makes people visualize. We played a sort of game about the intestine, in which the participants visualize the physiological process that causes diarrhea. The indigenous peoples are continually seeking, through public protests and encounters with government officials and non-governmental organizations, discussions and evaluation of their major problems related to health, land ownership, cultural recognition, education, and their legal rights. We believe that the initiative of the Pan American Health Organization, the governments of each country and the indigenous councils, the three of them together we hope, we are following, looking for solutions so that everything will get better. The various health-related programs currently being implemented in the Americas are focused primarily on the indigenous population. The cultural and regional differences among the indigenous communities prevent the use of generalized measures. It is necessary that health programs, both informative and preventive, be created to conform to the specific elements of each region. Language, customs, beliefs, and forms of social organization. To be successful, the programs must be able to count on the collaboration and leadership of the indigenous themselves making the endeavor a group project and using the various means of communication as well as the particular language of each population.